This presentation shows the location of major components of the 4701 controller. It also shows you how to remove the machine covers. You can find most of this information in Chapter 5 of the 4701 Repair Manual. This is a 4701 controller. It also contains the controller diskette drive. And this is an expansion frame containing an additional diskette drive. While expansion frames are not standard features, it's estimated that most 4700 systems will have them installed. There are three models of the 4701. Models 1 and 2 are used by the U.S. banking industry, while the Model 5 is a world trade product. For this demonstration, we'll use a Model 1. Let's start on the front of the 4701. Here is the power on off switch and the power on light. Above this are some status or indicator lights. Cast IPL, check light, ready light, and the alert light. Under normal operating conditions, only the ready and power on lights are on. This is the 4701 message display. It displays up to four alphabetic, numeric, or special symbol characters, and it is used to communicate to you or the operator. Here at the top is the reset key, which will return the controller to an initial power on state. Behind this operator panel door are additional controls. You can use a coin to open the cover latch. Here at the top are the loop speed switches used to establish the rate at which data is transferred between the controller and the loop attached devices. There are 16 switches in all, four for each of the four possible loops. This is the primary secondary speed switch. It controls the speed of the host link only when the multi-use loop, or R loop, feature is installed. This next group of eight switches are set by the customer with the address of the 4701 as established by the host system. Here is the interrupt key. It does what its name suggests, forces an interruption to the controller's normal processes. For example, it can force a dump of the controller's storage. Located under these two covers are switches that the customer normally doesn't need access to, but are important to you for diagnosis and feature conversion. Under this cover are two groups of eight feature switches and one group of four diagnostic switches. And the feature switches indicate the presence of DCA, loop, diskette, and host link adapter features. The four diagnostic switches are used to loop tests that are on the diagnostic diskette. Under this cover are five rotary switches set with the controller's serial number. Again, these switches are set at the factory and should agree with the serial number stamp on the controller's frame. By the way, any of the switches that are preset at the factory should not be changed unless you are installing a feature change or a diagnostic procedure tells you to do so. Here's one more item on the operator's panel. It's called the Encryption Facility Key Lock. This standard feature provides the customer with the means to secure his data. On the right side of the 4701 is the diskette drive. To remove the diskette, turn the handle counterclockwise, then pull out the diskette. When inserting a diskette, be sure the label is in the upper left corner. After inserting, turn the handle clockwise to lock it in place. Now, let's go around to the rear of the 4701. If we start in the lower right corner, we can see the AC power cord connector, the main fuse, and the AC power connector for the expansion frame. Also, the control cable connector for the expansion frame. The connectors for the loops are located here. Since each requires two connectors, this 4701 can handle two loops. Here are the DCA connectors. Up to eight terminals, such as the 3278 keyboard display, are connected here. Finally, 
Here's the host system signal cable connector. The actual type of cable and plug depends on the type of host interface feature that is installed. The installation instructions will clarify these requirements. Now that we've seen all the exterior components, we'll disconnect the expansion frame and take a brief tour under the covers. Let's start with the 4701. After removing AC power to the 4701, disconnect both the signal cable and the AC power cord from the expansion frame. The cover comes off the top and is held in place by two screws on the bottom. So lay the 4701 controller on its side. Using a metric Allen wrench, loosen these two captive screws. With the cover loosened, set the unit upright and slide off the cover. Starting on the left side of the controller, let's locate some of the major components. The most obvious of these are the logic board and the logic cards. The World Trade Model 5 has a shorter board. Above the logic board are two configurator cards containing switches set at the factory. If necessary, the switch settings can be verified by referring to the 4701 repair manual. Here are the other components you can see from the left side of the controller. DCA driver receiver card. The four system cables that attach the operator's panel to the logic board and the power connectors. Let's look at the right side of the unit. The diskette drive assembly dominates it completely and you'll have to remove it if you need to gain access to the back side of the logic board. The removal of the diskette drive assembly is a straightforward four-step process. Let me preview it for you without actually removing it. Place the diskette drive handle in the operated position. Remove the signal connector. Remove the power connectors. And these four screws. Slide the unit toward the rear and lift it out. The last major unit we will look at is the power supply. The power supply is in the bottom of the unit. To get to it, lay the unit on its side, remove these four screws to free the bottom cover. Here's something to take special note of. Part of the bottom cover fits inside a slot behind the AC power cord connector. This safety feature prevents you from removing the cover without first removing the power cord. With the cover off, you can see various components in the power supply. For example, here's the fan assembly and the power supply board. On the power supply board is the LED indicator, which will be referenced by the 4701 symptom fix charts to help diagnose DC power failures. You should also be aware that the power supply board has a separate AC fuse located here. Well, that gives you a brief familiarization with the 4701 controller. The expansion frame looks very similar to the controller, but really is not. The covers are removed in the same manner as the 4701, but it has no operator panel, no pluggable logic cards, and no power supplies. It does contain a fan, an identical diskette drive assembly, and a diskette drive control card.
Here again, any details that are required are covered in the 4701 Repair Manual. This concludes the video segment. Return to the FIS terminal and continue with the course. In this presentation, we're going to demonstrate how to start up an operational diskette, execute a couple of application programs called 3604 clock and transaction receipt, and last, we'll show you how to log on and log off the subsystem. The procedures we discuss here apply only to the operational diskette. We've already talked about diagnostic diskette startup procedures in another presentation. Before I begin, I'd like to tell you about what goes into operational diskettes, especially the specific diskette we're concerned with here. Operational diskettes contain a 4701 control program, the system monitor program, and the extended controller test. These programs and tests, you'll remember, are also on the diagnostic diskette. This particular operational diskette has two demonstration application programs on it, 3604 clock and transaction receipt. After startup is completed, both application programs will begin automatically. Later, I'll show you how these two programs work. The configuration of the 4700 system we will use consists of a 4701 controller, a 3604 keyboard display on loop 1, address 01, a 4704 keyboard display on loop 2, address 02, and a 4710 printer on loop 2, address 03. Now let's look closely at the controller startup procedure. Startup begins when you insert the operational diskette in the controller and press the power on key. Now the power on tests begin. First, the console indicators are tested. Then various messages will appear in the 4701 display as the controller hardware is tested. If the power on test runs successfully, the extended controller tests are read in from the diskette and executed by the controller. If there aren't any errors, it takes about 30 seconds for all the diagnostics to run. When the I messages appear in the display, the control program and the system monitor programs on the diskette are being loaded into the controller. When the controller display contains the message I-699, a two-line message will appear on the keyboard display attached to loop one. In our setup, the display is a 3604. The first line tells you basic information about the diskette. has a five-digit message, 00001. That message is a request to enter on the keyboard the type of start you want. The start response you'll use most often is a two. That indicates a warm start with the communications link to the host site having been started. If the 4700 is going to be operated independent of the host, then a startup code nine is used. If you don't enter a start code, the system defaults to a warm start, code 9, and program loading continues. Warm start doesn't reset the controller log records. Entering the type of start you want is the last step in the startup procedure. Here, the digit 2 for a warm start 
has been entered. After the start code has been entered, the controller continues to load. Finally, the controller enters operational phase. Startup is complete when the keyboard display screen goes blank. However, a customer can also program the system to get a unique message instead of the normal blank screen. The diskette we are using has been programmed so that the 3604 clock program is automatically started on this 3604, which is attached to loop 1, address 1. The clocking program will continue to run unattended until power is removed from the 3604 or the 4701. Now we can execute the transaction receipt application, which is programmed for the 4704 on loop 2, address 2. We could also log on as the control operator and execute some system commands. We'll start with the transaction receipt application program. Follow these instructions on the display. I'll enter the account number 13579 from the keyboard as directed. Then today's date, a six digit entry. Now the customer's name, Jane Doe. I'll enter a $50 deposit as five. Zero, zero, zero. Assuming a previous old balance of $100, the new balance is $150. To get a printed receipt for the customer and for bank records, the teller inserts a cut form in the 4710 and depresses the start key. I'll remove the form and validate the printed account number, name, deposit, and balance with the transaction data on the screen. Now I'll perform these instructions to print the journal on the 4710. Everything checks. Incidentally, this A on the journal printout is the program method of identifying which of the two start keys on the 4710 has been depressed. We've just completed a single pass of the transaction receipt program. The instructions tell us to press the enter key to get us back to the starting point. Instead of repeating that operation, I'd like to show you how it's possible at this point to log on the system monitor to execute some control operator commands. Remember that when we log on, we will be reassigning the terminal from its current workstation assignment to workstation 1. The procedure for logging on is described in the 4700 subsystem operating procedures. When logging on, first press the reset key three times. See the message 90000. Now enter the control operator's ID code, which you must get from the customer. For security reasons, the machine won't display the code while you are entering it. At this point, the message 91111 and the loop and the device address of the device you are logging on will appear. These tell you you have logged on successfully to the system monitor. In our example, we see loop number 2 and device address 02 for the 4704. Now that we are logged on, the system monitor program will execute any 4700 command we enter using this keyboard. For instance, I can change the display format of this 4704 from a model 12 to a model 11. Model 11 characters are larger and easier to read. The command is 048 space one, one. Of course, the enter key must be depressed for each entry. Now I'll display.
display the last five messages in the system log by invoking the command 001. The results are displayed on the 4704. Before we log off, let's restore the 4704 display to a model 12. I'll enter the command 048 space 12 and hit the enter key. That appears to have restored it correctly. So, let's log off the system by entering 000, zero, zero and pressing the enter key. To reactivate the transaction receipt application program, we need only to press the enter key again. There. We are right back at the beginning. Let's summarize what you've seen in this presentation. First, you saw what a system operator does during startup of an operational diskette. Then, you saw how two sample application programs were run. Finally, you saw how to log on 